Okay. Um, thank you to um, Maya and to Rupert uh, for the invitation. I haven't been to uh, Vilnius or Lithuania before, um, and it's great. I really like it. I think I'm going to move here. Um, <laughs> um, okay, so I, I'm going to speak maybe for about 45 minutes um, about a sort of series of themes related to this conception of social reproduction and ideas around um, wage labour in particular and the kind of expansion of the category of, of work um, as it's presented in various uh, feminist theories from the 70s in particular, but that have come back really um, in a wide range of discussions because of their kind of relevance. Um, and I want to finish at the end by saying a little bit about the relationship of these uh, ideas about social reproduction to art as well because of the relation to the show and uh, maybe this might be uh, a way of opening up a discussion as well to maybe say some provocations about social reproduction and art um, and artwork. Um, and I also want to reflect a little bit because of this uh, stress on the um, affective turn or turn to thinking about emotion, um, which has been going on for quite a long time, which again I think has its roots in uh, particularly kind of 70s discussions about the way in which uh, emotion and character and personality increasingly became the kind of resources of a particular kind of uh, shift in the economy towards service work. Uh, and so on, which I think probably many people in the global north are very familiar with in particular, um, but it's a global uh, pattern as well, thinking about, um, thinking about service work. Um, is it okay, like volume and speed, or shall I, yeah? Okay. Um, okay, so I want to start by, by talking about these, um, the feminist discussions about, um, about the status of work and wage labour. Uh, I think, as I say, they've recently come back into quite a lot of focus. Um, there's a recent issue of uh, Viewpoint magazine, which is an excellent online um, sort of political and theoretical journal, which I sent the link, which is on the Facebook that people can, can read. Um, I think partly this uh, sort of resurrection of interest uh, in these ideas can be explained by a kind of theoretical and some, sen some sense practical move within Marxist and uh, post-Marxist thought. Um, to try to challenge older models of labour um, and indeed labour organising. So trying to think about new ways of, of organising um, in these slight shifts in the uh, type of work that people are doing. So if much of the work done in the world now is service work uh, involving effective and emotional labour, which is not to say these, these features weren't there in uh, you know, earlier decades, but I think the, as a theoretical object, they've only kind of increased um, um, in terms of discussion of them. Um, I guess there are also kind of broader empirical trends um, in the labour markets um, in terms of the kind of uh, dominance of, of women uh, in wage labour. Uh, there are now more women in, in paid work in the USA, for example, for the first time ever for about, about four or five years ago, the shift, uh, more than men, let's say. Um, and so given yeah, so how can we expand a kind of concept of work that would relate to these sort of uh, transformations, both kind of quantitative and qualitative, we might say, in, in labour? And I think that given that feminist work on these topics has been strong for a very long time, it makes sense to go back um, to look at these uh, ideas. And I think in particular, I want to focus on this concept of care. Um, I'm very interested in the concept of, of care as it applies to not only wage labour, but as a mode of politics. Um, and I want to, in a sense, defend the notion of, of care and, and recenter care um, against kind of value in the economic sense, um, which maybe we can discuss and perhaps there's something uh, provocative about, about that. I, and I've been thinking a lot about this uh, idea of militant empathy, uh, which is like my favourite phrase at the moment, which is uh, thinking about how we might weaponise, um, in a sense, uh, often kind of quite negative or emotions that have like quite negative impact. What does it mean to feel almost too much uh, for, for others in a political uh, sense? How can we uh, use this strategically, I think, to organise? Um, given that this is, this is already happening, uh, I think, the way in which empathy is kind of central to a lot of people's politics. Um, we can talk about specifics later. So I'm interested in this question of uh, the universal quality of nur nurturance. Um, that is to say, all the work that exists in order to keep life going, 
waged and unwaged. And the, social, the point about social reproduction, I suppose, is it's this much broader category. It's not simply uh, self-sustenance. It's not simply producing uh, surplus value. It's uh, the int all of the processes that kind of keep uh, everything uh, uh, moving. I think the erasure and undermining of women's role in this is a central feature of capitalism. As Silvia Federici puts it, through my involvement in the women's movement, I realised that the reproduction of human beings is the foundation of every economic and political system. And reproduction here should be read in the broadest possible sense, as the complex of activities and relations by which our life and labour are daily reconstituted. That is to say, everything that makes life possible in the first place and everything that continues to sustain it. Um, reproduction in this broadest sense um, is where the contradictions inherent in alienated labour are the most explosive, according to Federici. In the feminist analysis of social reproduction, we should note that care, then, is a central category. The double character of reproductive work, as Federici puts it, means that social reproduction is not simply work that reproduces for capital, right, in the sense of uh, getting people ready for work, prepared to be a wage labourer, and so on. Um, but also sometimes against it. Um, care that is coerced or considered a duty is a huge problem. Um, the idea of coerced emotional labour, um, the idea that um, because you're a woman, you're supposed to care, um, it, she's extremely critical of this, uh, this idea. But against this, she opposes the idea of communities of care um, that are self-reliant, and acknowledge the pressure of implicit and explicit reproductive demands. And Federici argues that these situations um, are genuinely uh, oppositional because they don't uphold the logic of enforced atomization and individual self-promotion, otherwise demanded by the job market. So I guess the fantasy of like homo economicus or the, the idea of the kind of isolation, the isolated uh, individual um, constantly in competition with everyone else uh, and so on. Um, and of course, she's looking at the way in which that sort of um, those forms of care are devalued um, and ignored and, and not really discussed um, enough. Um, but if there is a generalised absence of care, what steps in? Um, this is a kind of question. So Federici's recent work is on elder care, where she describes an un unstable redistribution of care work of the elderly in particular, onto the shoulders of women family members, as well as poorly paid and badly treated workers from other countries. The fact that questions of elder care do not top the agenda of the social justice movements and labour movements internationally uh, is a serious problem, Federici thinks. Um, and she thinks it, it's tied to a kind of fetishism for wage work and the wage earner um, and to the individual's history of employment. So the post-worker, then, and the way in which we even speak about people as, as being retired, um, you know, still maintains this kind of link to employment. Um, so it's not simply that they are um, elder people, it's that they, they still maintain this, uh, their status by virtue of the fact that they had been workers, wage workers. Um, the post-worker, the retiree, then, becomes a kind of absence for both governments and the Marxist left. Just as, ne just as the neglect and abuse of women's work in general was brought to light in early leftist feminist movements. The replacement of care by machines in the forms of, uh, form of robots or screens is clearly inadequate. And this is um, kind of key for me because there's lots of discussion at the moment about automation and the way in which automation could uh, replace uh, labour. And, and um, you get a lot of people like accelerationists and so on who are envisaging a post-work uh, world um, where they, they think that automation will come to, um, you know, take over most uh, jobs. And in a sense, um, this is not an unattractive proposition, right? I mean, who would want to do crap work if it could be done uh, by a machine? I think the problem is, though, there are certain jobs which involve emotional labour and care, which it seems, on the face of it, very hard to delegate to uh, machines. Would we really want robots to uh, look after uh, people, for example? Uh, and I think they neglect this entire dimension of, of, of work, partly because it's not valued as wage work or unwaged work. You know, they simply kind of don't register it in some ways. Um, so re reproductive labour cannot be automated, whatever futurist fantasies there are. As Federici points out, describing work that involves the communication of affect or emotion as immaterial, as many discussions have it these days, actually does an injustice to elder care and other care work, which involves a complete engagement with the persons to be re reproduced 
and is in practice anything other than immaterial. So the idea that somehow emotional work or care work is immaterial absolutely uh, neglects the fact that, that we're talking about dealing with people's bodies, with shit, with you know, uh, all of this very, very like visceral um, uh, stuff. Um, and this is what reproductive labour is and what care work is. I mean, it's dealing with these things. Um, and there's a kind of occlusion, again, of this kind of like, you know, unsexy work, right, in the name of this fantasy of uh, immaterial, uh, effective labour. So part of the solution to this situation, uh, Federici argues, as well as a transformation in the social and the sexual division of labour and the recognition of reproductive work, um, is for her um, the idea that the seeds of the new world will not be planted online, she says, but in the, co in the cooperation we can develop amongst ourselves. Um, and in a sense, she remains optimistic about these images of, of these communities of care, which she thinks are genuinely, uh, potentially oppositional um, to the reproduction of uh, capital. Um, we might want to you know, question the, the scale of this possibility, um, whether it is uh, you know, really uh, kind of realistic. Um, and I think thinking back to some of these debates around, for example, wages for housework, which uh, many of you will have, will have heard about, um, there are still kind of lots of relevance, uh, relevant um, elements to these discussions, I think. Um, th so on the one hand, we have the autonomous Marxist idea that domestic labour creates surplus value, either directly or indirectly, as Cathy Weeks puts it, which obviously goes against the kind of classical uh, Marxist uh, analysis. Um, so Cathy Weeks, in her recent book, The Problem of Work, um, argues that there should be economic recognition of the value that this work produces, not in order to valorise housework <coughs> of such or, or, or domestic labour, but to make a broader point about how the wage relation operates within capital and how it depends upon vast quantities of unpaid, usually female labour. As Federici puts it in Caliban and the Witch, summing up earlier debates, a social system of production that does not recognise the production and reproduction of the worker as a social economic activity and a source of capital accumulation, but mystifies it instead as a natural resource or a personal service, so the idea of doing care work or, or out of love or duty or some sort of gender role, um, whilst pro while profiting from the wageless condition of the labour involved. So in a sense, the, the centering of this discussion of care work um, is uh, confronting wage labour, the, the kind of reality of what la wage labour is, as opposed to focusing on production uh, and, and uh, surplus value alone. Um, and in the wages for housework uh, debates, um, there was always a key anti-work um, dimension, or the struggle not to work, as Dalla Costa puts it, um, in Women in the Subversion of the Community from 1971. So this is a central part of this campaign. She writes, men, when they reject work, consider themselves militant. And when we reject our work, these same men consider us nagging wives. So the tension for a demand for unwaged work to be recognised and valued and the demand for an end to work, wage labour under capitalism, in and outside the home, is there right from the start of these discussions in the early 70s. As Federici puts it in Wages Against Housework, to demand wages for housework does not mean to say that if we are paid, we will continue to do it. It means precisely the opposite. On the other hand, there is this idea that women should fight to enter paid employment. I think that's the argument that won. It wasn't the wages for housework argument that won. It was the uh, mass entry of women into the workforce argument um, that won. <laughs> um, and also alongside that, the idea that women have been paid for jobs that are characteristic of housework for a long time. Right? So of course there's still masses of unwaged labour um, going on, but of course what we've also seen is the outsourcing or the, or the paying of what were formerly personal uh, services. So obviously you can pay someone to clean your house, you can pay someone to look after your child or your parent and uh, so on. Um, and, the, and the economies of those very low paid um, and often migrant uh, economies as, as well are, are key. I mean, so that's in a sense what happened. It wasn't the, the wages for housework idea that, that won. Um, Angela Davis makes an important point um, in an essay called The Approaching Obsolescence of Housework, a working class perspective, where she says that in the United States, women of colour and especially black women have been re receiving wages for housework for untold decades. Cleaning women, domestic workers' maids, these are the women who know better than anyone else what it means to receive wages for housework. And furthermore, um, she, uh, Angela Davis at this, at this point, uh, criticising wages for housework as primarily a kind of, uh, you know, perhaps bourgeois middle class uh, demand, um, suggests that 
what we should do instead is campaign for equal access to paid employment, um, as there's a kind of revolutionary potential in that, because it is in the workplace that workers will together organise against exploitation. So Angela Davis writes, the only significant steps to towards ending domestic slavery have in fact been taken in the existing socialist countries. I mean, clearly this is an essay from uh, uh, before uh, the late 80s. Moreover, under capitalism, campaigns for job on an equal basis with men, combined with movements for institutions such as subsidised public health care, contain an explos explosive revolutionary potential. What I think is interesting about um, Angela Davis's revolutionary argument is um, how much, in a, in a way, without the revolutionary demands, the liberal feminist demand for um, uh, sort of equal access to employment has uh, maps onto it in some ways, in that both stress access to the workplace is the fundamental lever in achieving historical equality with men. Um, however, the, the liberal feminist position on work tends to view work as an end in itself, of course, and as a personal good. And I think we've seen the, like, uh, I don't know, the, the revenge or the resurrection of this idea in terms of the lean-in idea that somehow uh, women must uh, participate and, uh, even more enthusiastically than men in wage work in order to uh, you know, become CEOs and uh, so on. Um, so this is you know, a kind of ideological um, idea that, that we are in, we are living through this idea. Um, and of course the liberal feminist position does, does not qu question uh, the exploitative character of wage work uh, qua capitalist function. Angela Davis's approach sees work and the possibilities for organising it affords as a site of revolutionary worker self-organisation and emancipation. Okay, but this, m what, what can we say then about uh, service uh, work or work that is much more fragmentary, work, work that's much more precarious, agency work? Um, it seems harder on the face of it to organise or self-organise when work itself has um, perhaps changed uh, in some ways. Are there grounds for being optimistic about the emancipatory potential of work, either from the lib liberal feminist liberation through participation position or from the Marxist feminist model of the workplace as a hub of working class organisation? The exploitation that is at the heart of the capitalist mode of work has hardly vanished in recent decades. If anything, it has increased. At the same time, we have the idea that work itself has become more feminised in, in some parts of the world um, and in particular sectors. Um, so I just want to talk about this concept of the feminisation of labour. So often it involves the idea that work um, has increasingly taken on the attributes typically associated with women, right? That is to say communication, uh, service economy work, care work, um, and what Ali Hochschild uh, very famously called emotional labour. And, and she's one of the first people in the managed heart, she's now more than 40 years old, um, to try and expand the Marxist uh, conception of work with the addition of this idea of emotional labour. Um, which is to say, uh, you know, what is it that gets exploited? And she uses as a paradigmatic case study, which maybe seems slightly dated, but she looks at um, air hostesses and the fact that the vast majority of their work, in a sense, is to sell a performance, um, to sell the way they, the, you know, to, to perform happiness and... Uh, the, the desire to, to help, if you like. Um, and it's interesting to note, in terms of thinking about strikes or refusal, refusal of work, um, that there have been uh, smile strikes, for example, among air hostesses. So I think it was like a Singaporean airline that um, where the, the staff decided to go on strike over paying conditions and they refused to smile, um, which is a, an older uh, feminist <laughs> idea about uh, refusing to, to laugh or smile when men say something uh, stupid. Um, <laughs> Uh, so it was resurrected as a kind of labour struggle um, with, with this recognition that what was being provided was a form of emotional or effective uh, service. Um, so theories of the feminisation of labour overlap with other various contemporary theories of work, so effective labour, cognitive capitalism and so on. You will have heard all of these ideas, um, popularised by Hart and Negri in particular. So these descriptions of work attempt to capture something of the post-Fordist nature, so-called post-Fordist nature of much contemporary labour. So the work in question here involves, amongst other things, knowledge, language skills, emotional skills, and a kind of blurrier relationship between life and play. And this is very relevant for artists, and, and artists are often treated by people like Lazzarato as like paradigmatic service workers, in a sense, because of the kind of demand that you... Uh, sort of be performing at any given time, that you always should be networking, that you are, in a sense, your work, um, 
and so on. And if you don't participate in these kind of economies of signs and signification and communication, then you are not kind of uh, uh, going to uh, be able to continue. You're not going to be able to reproduce your, yourself. Um, so elements of one's life that may once have been associated with the private sphere, so love or leisure or personality, <laughs> have increasingly become attributes to be mined by employers anxious to give their customers the best service. It is not only one's labour power that is sold, but also one's soul, as someone like Bifo would say. At the same time, the desire for the life-work balance, if one were to maintain the illusion that they're still separate things, has been rebranded as flexible um, work, where women especially are paid less and given fewer hours, um, because there's no kind of real attempt to deal with um, <laughs> what, what a life-work balance might uh, actually mean. And this has been kind of translated as uh, agency work or precarious work is somehow freeing, like you have a freedom to be paid less and to not have any job security uh, and so on. Um, so the unhappy marriage may lo no longer be between Marxism and feminism, as one famous collection has it, but between feminism and work, where the latter promised so much but has failed to deliver, uh, permitting not the expansion of life um, but its further exploitation. One common feature of much discu contemporary discussion of wage labour is, is a description of its precariousness or precarity, which I'm sure you're all aware of. This concept attempts to capture m much of what is supposedly lost um, in contemporary employment. So job security, pensions, holidays, sick pay and other benefits. Work is increasingly seen as sub something fragmentary, part-time and uncertain. Um, and certainly just empirically, I mean, after the, the global economic crash, where you, you had governments um, sort of cutting all of the public sector jobs, um, the, the kind of new private sector jobs that came, that started to emerge, the so-called green shoots, um, were often particularly, I mean, just in the UK, for example, zero hour contract jobs, for example, where you don't have any um, uh, set hours, but you can be called at any moment to kind of step in and do some work for very little uh, money. Uh, with no security whatsoever, right? So you have this kind of um, expansion of like precarious uh, work almost uh, everywhere, really. Um, at the same time as all the public sector jobs, because all the libraries are, are being closed and uh, all of those things are, are gone. And we can talk about the public and private um, question as well, if you like. So one knock-on effect of this idea is that the um, is that the working class has been dis displaced and rendered geographically more mobile. But some feminists have questioned the originality of the precarious work thesis, in particular its take up by theorists like Hart and Negri, who are at the, the forefront of such thinking, particularly through their introduction of the term multitude, um, which was designed to capture the amorphous relationship between employment and unemployment. So, so as a kind of post-Marxist attempt to, um, I don't know, you know reconceptualise uh, the proletariat, I suppose. Like, how do you have a conception of uh, humanity that's somehow uh, positioned between employment and unemployment? Um, and the constitutive quality of that which is exploited in contemporary labour, namely the capacity to network, to manipulate language and information. Federici points out that the concept of the multitude suggests that all divisions within the working class are gone or are no longer politically relevant. But this is obviously an illusion. Some feminists have pointed out that precarious labour is not a new phenomenon. Women always had a precarious relation to wage labour. Contemporary theorisation of work appears to only just be catching up with feminist insights from 40 years ago. What is captured in the thought of precarity is something that has dominated the way in which female labour has been understood in previous eras. Federici goes on to argue that unless the feminist conception of work is placed at the centre of our understanding of labour in general, and to go back to the, what I was saying about care, then nothing of these transformations will be understood. She says the Negrian theory of precarious labour ignores, bypasses one of the most important contributions of feminist theory and struggle, which is the redefinition of work and the recognition of women's unpaid reproductive labour as a key source of capitalist accumulation. In redefining housework as work, as not a personal service, but the work that produces and reproduces labour power, Feminists have uncovered a crucial new ground of exploitation that Marx and Marxist theory completely ignored. All of the important political insights contained in those analyses are now brushed aside as if they were of no relevance to an understanding of the present organisation of production. And I think one of the key th reasons why this is so important is concerns what it might mean to, to resist reproduction. Okay, because clearly there's a huge difference between... Um, 
putting down tools and leaving the factory and striking in that kind of old classical model and, and uh, refusing to care because refusing to care would mean abandoning uh, um, sort of uh, emotional relations. It would mean not looking after children or babies. It would mean not looking after um, um, older people who rely on you. Okay, so there's a clear uh, limitation, right, uh, or, a, or a kind of strategic question about how would we perform care, which is happening all the time anyway, um, but in such a way that wouldn't... Um, you know, let people die. I mean, you know, we have governments that are perfectly happy to uh, let people die. I mean, people in Britain who've, who've had their benefits removed, um, you know, are, are dying. I mean, you know, we have the situation where, where governments no longer feel any kind of uh, responsibility to the welfare state, to the public good, and there are, you know, the kind of erosion of safety nets. Um, so it cannot be the solution to the question of care that we refuse to care because this is kind of impossible. So it's, it's like thinking about, well, what would it mean to resist the reproduction of capital whilst not um, resisting the reproduction of, of care, or the continued care um, of each other? Okay, um, so Federici, I think, is right to point to women's work and particularly the expe expectation that women will perform vast quantities of unpaid labour as the hidden location of exploitation and precisely where contemporary writing on effective and precarious labour would do well to look. Her analysis can only be expanded into the expectation that everyone will be expected to do more work for free, as we're seeing. And, and, and so, you know, talking about the feminisation of labour is talking about the feminisation of all labour, I mean, that of men included. So zero-hours contracts, for example, I think are, are so paradigmatic in this sense, you know, that there, there is no longer any kind of idea that you know, you as a worker will have any security whatsoever. You may not even have work. So we, we're kind of in the situation where everyone is potentially a worker, but no one necessarily has any work. And therefore, no one ha necessarily has any wages uh, with which to sustain their existence. Um, you know, and I think another kind of interesting example for me is, uh, for example, there's this uh, sandwich chain shop in Britain called pret manger They're everywhere. And part of their contract that people sign for very low paid uh, work is that they will perform happiness, <laughs> that they are basically being paid in part to act friendly. So they're encouraged to kind of touch each other at work, to be like constantly uh, bright and perky uh, to everyone who comes in, even if they don't feel like it. And, and Hochschild, for example, in the Managed Heart, you know, more than 40 years ago, was already talking about this idea of cognitive dissonance whereby, you know, when you have to perform an emotion that you don't feel, like you're supposed to be happy or you're supposed to be, um, you know, smiley and friendly, but actually inside you feel like shit and you feel like dying, that this actually, like, you know, causes really serious, quite, like, psychological uh, damage. Um, and I think we see a lot of this kind of uh, pressure on people to perform emotion, like emotion is, in a sense, what's being um, bought and, and sold. Anyway, um, Okay, so her analysis, I think, yeah, can, can only be expanded into the expectation that everyone will be expected to do more work for free from internships, for example, zero hours contracts, zero, uh, unpaid overtime. The feminization of labour alongside its quantitative and qualitative dimensions is also the idea that all work will come to resemble the worst of women's work, so historically what women's work was. That is to say, badly paid, if at all, terrible conditions, and the fantasy that uh, somehow every employee is doing it from the goodness of his or her heart. You know, so it's not enough to turn up to work for a badly paid or zero-hours contract. You also have to pretend that you are enjoying it. Um, OK, I just wanted to um, talk a little bit. Time did do we start? Like four? Yeah. 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 Oh, right. Like maybe just like sort of ten minutes. Talking about... Perhaps the relationship between these concepts of reproductive labour um, and work and artwork and maybe raise some kind of questions about um, the role of art. I've already mentioned the idea that often theorists use artists as a paradigmatic example of, of immaterial uh, labourers. Um, okay, so... In, in her 2004 study, I mean, I'm focusing quite a lot on, on Federici, but in this very famous study, Caliban and the Witch, uh, which some of you would have uh, read, um, through this kind of serious historical analysis, seeks to identify a world of female subjects that capitalism had to destroy in order to proceed. And she's talking about enclosures um, in particular, and, the, and we can talk about new enclosures, I mean, today as well. 
Um, so she, she talks about the destruction of the heretic, the healer, the disobedient wife, the woman who dared to live alone, the obeyer woman who poisoned the master's food and inspired the slaves to revolt. Federici identifies the destruction of female subjects as integral to the systematic subject, subjugation of women's labour and reproductive function to the reproduction of the workforce. So in a sense, capital had to enclose the reproductive uh, function uh, for itself, if you saw I mean, it couldn't be permitted to exist in circuits outside of this. Um, so that, and the kind of um, construction of a new patriarchal order based on the exclusion of women from wage work in the first place and the subordination to men and the mechanisation of the proletarian body uh, which entailed that women became quote a, a machine for the production of new workers um, and so this is what Federici says happens historically and the witches then were the uh, had to be burnt because they were bearers of certain kinds of knowledge um, and this was what was uh, sort of had to be destroyed so she says that women have historically been stripped of particular knowledges that they possessed and particular modes of being and turned into workers, domestic workers, baby-making factories, etc. No wonder feminism has spent so much time and energy working out where women's work begins and ends. Bored of the role of creative work in all of this, the female artist, let's say, Federici's list of female subjects that capitalism needed to demonise, so the figure of the witch and the brutal and terrifying witch hunts of the feudal e era, are the central features of her history in this book. They possess talents of healing, but also of antagonism and disobedience. The woman who dared to live alone is the one who exited the circuits of male-dominated economic relations and perhaps refuses to have children. And of course, this is tied up with, with a move to thinking about property in terms of primogeniture and... and uh, um, yeah, property as uh, fu fundamentally private as opposed to um, something in common. So that you know the enclosure is the enclosure of the commons. Um, so access to shared resources. Um, is the female artist, in some sense, then the one who refuses to subsume her labour to capitalism and to the reproduction of the labour force in the name of an entirely different order of creativity and production? And is this even uh, possible? One of the cliches of contemporary capitalism, or theorising of contemporary capitalism is the idea that all ideas are assimilable, that any new mode of creation and resistance will ultimately be swallowed up and its original force muted by the speed and ability of capital to turn anything into profit. I mean, it's a cliche for a reason, though we could say. Once subversive images and ideas are today's normality, the far, right, far out becomes the all too close. At the same time, those modes of activity we would most want to remain outside of the circuits of capture become the things most taken from us, Work performed out of love or affection turns out to be the pillar upon which work in general can continue. Children are therefore future workers. Taking care of one's family is at the same time ensuring that workers are well fed, slept and emotionally stable enough to participate productively as employees. Seen this way, one could uh, become cynical and desire to withdraw completely, become like Melville's Bartleby. I would prefer not to. I would prefer not to work, not to have kids, not to keep capitalism going. But there are always other modes of being, other ways of living, I guess, which is what Federici is trying to say with her communities of care idea, real or imaginary. The ecologically friendly self-sufficiency model of recent decades has had more than a passing attraction uh, for many, not only for the sake of the planet, but also for the sake of human relations as such, and for the desire for contact not mediated through conditions of competition, employability, and so on. But does being an artist necessitate a certain kind of withdrawal from the world and from the circuits of capitalism, insofar as this is possible? The contemporary art world hardly seems to indicate that this is desirable. Of all of the figures of the immaterial worker, the effective labourer, the precariat and so on, the artist seems peculiarly uh, describable using these terms. And the way in which he or she is compelled to operate in a frenzy of networking, communicativity, self-promotion, amidst an almost total lack of remuneration, stability and certainty, makes the artist the new face of flexible labour for many. How do we link up the material conditions of the female body and the enclosures made upon it that Federici describes and the supposedly immaterial nature of much aesthetic labour? Is it possible? Part of the difficulty here is the way in which immaterial has sometimes been understood as lacking reality, as somehow exempt from production. And I think, you know, a lot of discussion about... Um, the virtual and so on have kind of uh, made this uh, complex uh, problem as well. However conceptual one's work is as an artist, however, the material conditions of this work are not easily placed to one side. 
Like other knowledge economy workers, intellectuals, critics and the like, we are sometimes supposed to forget that our, abs our abstractions and our ideas are filtered to an environment that is all too dependent on real practical conditions. Artists who take up the material as such in a thoughtful way, working with waste, the products of industry, exposing the links that tie us to production overseas, for example, are reminding us that one never thinks in a vacuum and one never can. The immaterial, effective dimension of contemporary work, whether it be in call centres or in art studios, depends upon a condensed and solidified mass of really existing hardware, both human and manufactured, the wires that carry sound waves, the computers that process information, the body that sits in a chair for hours connected to whichever set of machines um, carries command and information that flows through the worker. And I think, for example, people like Bifo have written a lot about this um, idea of, of net time and the kind of overstimulated internet brain um, that can never uh, sleep and lacks a body. And he talks about the need to create a kind of collective body um, that can somehow, in a way, calm down this uh, you know, electrocuted brain, as he describes it. Um, and I think there's a way in which perhaps Federici's communities of care um, might sort of supplement Bifo's very melancholic description of the city, where he describes this world in which um, there's very little kind of uh, interaction that involves genuine emotion, there's very little touching. He says that no one has time to, to caress and kiss each other anymore. Um, so the immaterial effective component of this work, like the whistling of the wind across a field of barley with all the work and resources that field involves, the bodily dimension of effective or emotional labour, the specific tone, the disposition, the posture, the friendliness or otherwise of the worker engaged in paid for service work is apt to be neglected if we see this work as solely about the communication of a certain mode of being from one person to another or group of others. How can art and an art that addresses these issues from the standpoint of women or from specifically feminist concerns at least of avoid the too blunt division between matter and that which isn't matter, whether the latter be perceived as words, ideas, concepts, emotions and so on? We need to reformulate this question to spin it around and break it off from familiar axes, to refuse the mystification of production and reproduction, as Federici says. Without the bodily labour and the labour of the body of the woman, artist or otherwise, there is no understanding of labour in general. There is no sense, though, at the same time, in didactically saying that all feminist art must address this issue, um, though there is much work that does. But to understand what we mean when we talk about creativity, production, labour, and hear the resonances of the words as they play out across the borders between private life and public life, the life of employment employ and employability, which often depends upon renouncing frequently against one's will, one type of reproduction in favour of another. A certain analytic withdrawal from one-sided un one understandings of these frameworks may link back to a kind of fantasy image, perhaps, of the female artists with the skills of the women who historically had them stripped from them, denounced and ridiculed. Because what does a female artist do but generate new skills, design and make novel and unique creations? All artists do, for sure. But the female artist perhaps has an implicit dob double job to undertake, to rethink production and reproduction in such a way that the material and the immaterial, the personal and the objective, are no longer stark opposites. And thinking of the very famous feminist uh, claim that the personal is political, but also the second part of that phrase is that the political is personal. And I'm, I'm kind of much more interested in the, the second part of this famous phrase that almost always gets um, dropped. And what does it mean to think about uh, politics um, in a personal way, and I think that's where this kind of concept of militant empathy um, is important for me. Um, where the personal and the so-called objective are no longer stark opposites, to ensure that the body of the artist is not the body for another artist, as, as women have for so long also been in art. The work of the female artist is to go beyond work as we understand it, the double burden of which has characterised the lives of women for a very long time, to use artistic practice to rethink the notion of practice as such. The productive female knowledge economy, jeered at and savaged by capitalism, if seized and understood however obscurely, could force us to rethink what we mean when we say art at all, when we talk about the work and the artwork, who or what is working and for who, to generate what value, to exercise which affects, emotions and bodily responses. Much feminist art has of course been about or sometimes in the body, um, its ability or not to live up to what it is supposed to be. But in a way, this body can perhaps be seen as infinitely productive. Um, if the body of the female artist is understood to be necessarily in a critical relation vis-à-vis -vis our usual definitions of work and labour, 
The artwork is not complete until we have exhausted what we mean by work, and historically no one's work has been more abused, denigrated, and yet depended upon than that of women. Okay, the end. <laughs> That's okay, it's like... Um, just a, a question of, of, could you elaborate on these um, strategies of militant and... Yeah, sure. Well... Yeah, it's a really yeah, I guess it, 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 it partly comes out of the kind of struggles that I've been involved in. Uh, I, I think since particularly um, about 2010, so obviously in the UK in 2010, we had huge um, student protests and many people were arrested and lots of people went to prison and people were hurt very badly. And there was this sense of um, really, a, I suppose, the, the kinds of work that were involved in defending and supporting people who are in this position. Um, and I, it, was, it was thinking about the way in which almost, well, a, as a necessity, how people organised, if you like, um, communities of care to support one another when the state itself was <laughs> uh, trying to, you know, um, to send you to prison, to, you know, to, um, yeah, in a sense to make time hell for you, you know, and, and there is a peculiar form of, a uh, hellish relation to time, which is like waiting for a trial or waiting to see if you're going to be too imprisoned. And I think, you know, or even the time of going to court and all of these things. Um, and I was thinking about the way in which you, in that situation, you're, you're extremely uh, vulnerable in, in a sense, like emotionally vulnerable. I mean, the state can take however long it wants, right? It doesn't have a, an emotional relation to time, but you, of course, as a person and person caring for other people do. So time becomes this kind of weapon, and I've written about this idea of like, the weaponization of time. You know, that's, that's what the state has, if you like. It can weaponize time against you. Um, at the same time, the, 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 the sheer sort of like, support and, and love, if you like, of people coming to court to, to sit with you, to make you dinner when you, you're so tired, and these kinds of things. It was a, like a sort of emergency construction of communities of care, I suppose. So I was interested in that kind of uh, idea of care that stems from a political position or a set of political convictions in which you find yourself in direct confrontation with the state, I suppose. And I think as well as this, I've, uh, the sort of political work that I've been doing has also involved thinking about um, deaths in custody and, and what happens when the state uh, kills people, right? So primarily people of colour in Britain, where you're working with families who basically the worst possible thing you can imagine has happened to them. And they are asking for political support from people who haven't had the same experience, okay? Who don't, who cannot, in a sense, necessarily know what it's like to go through that. But that there, there has to be some moment of, of empathy, not to say your experience is the same as mine and therefore I can understand why you're in this position or why you have this relation to the state or why you keep fighting or why you still believe in justice even though you don't get any justice at any point. Do you see what I mean? So it was like, how can you, in a sense, I don't know, work with people who have had a different experience to you um, but still feel that your project, political project, is the same project. It's also a, a kind of gendered or feminist point about left, uh, some tendencies within leftist organising, I guess, which sometimes tends to focus on, you know, sort of objective analysis of the conditions and also a kind of image or a, a fantasy of a, a militancy um, which doesn't have room for like trauma, emotion, sadness, you know, that, that somehow in order to confront capital, you must be like tougher than capital somehow. And it's, you know, there's still, I think, maybe even if it's done in a tongue in cheek way or, a, you know, ironic way, there's still this kind of like somehow separation between, um, yes, this kind of hard bodied like confrontation with the state and this sort of, you know, softer, like you're not allowed to admit how hard this is actually. You know, so it's like trying to overcome that um, divide, um, yeah, in some ways. And to say that actually, look, you know, it's rational to be emotional, you know, just to say that, you know, that actually if you are, like, being <laughs> prosecuted or, you know, if, if the, the state are, like, hassling you or if you've lost somebody or, 
you know, at the, to the hands of the police or something. You know, it, it's perfectly rational to be extremely upset. It's kind of like <laughs> Well, yeah, exactly, and I guess that, yeah, there are kind of questions about, yeah, the so sort of, the social quality of emotion. You know, social reproduction is, of course, about the reproduction of um, sustainable modes of emotional life as well. I mean, everything that it takes for you not to be isolated and lonely, or how do we support, you know, how we support each other in terms of making sure that people, you know, are not feeling these very negative emotions, right? So how can they, you harbour that, existing, those existing networks of care, right, and not put them in the service of capital. Um, kind of, I'm just thinking of, let's say, economic. Yeah. But sort of things like credit ratings, and um, I don't know, I'm thinking about debt a lot. Yeah. But things like, I don't know, this, this rolling jubilee project? Are you familiar with that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, where they, yeah, they, they kind of, uh, basically out of a, a network of people decided to um, buy this junk debt and um, and then uh, get rid of it. Yeah. Um, but but it's, it's like like that's sort of like treating these kind of very in a way rational systems emotionally and that act of of, of, of emotionalizing them. Yeah. I, it, I think it's very complicated because at the same time we are supposed to feel for the economy. I mean, if you think about the anthropomorphic and emotional language that is involved in when we talk about, you know, when the state or when, you know, the economy is discussed, it's like if you think about things like, I don't know, consumer confidence or like, you know, the market is rallying or, well, you know, well, we're well, supposed well, to. Discussion around debt yeah. It's highly, highly charged. Yeah. You know, and this idea of like, you know, well, the economy is depressed, therefore we need to like tighten our belts. You know, do you know what I mean? So like, the economy is this like pathologized animal that's sick. You know, and like when the f financial crash was happening, the front cover of the Economist had this like wounded lion, and it was like, you know, this was like capital, and it was anyway. But but this idea that somehow it's more important to care about the feelings of the economy, even though it doesn't have any, because it's not a thing like that, than your own. You know, that somehow. You know, this is the kind of moral argument that governments are making. You know, you need to, you need to like change your behaviour so that the economy can feel happier. You know, and like screw your happiness or collective happiness. You know, um, but I think I mean on the specific point about debt. Yeah, I mean I think like there are these kind of micro strategies. I mean things around like reoccupying occup um, houses that were repossessed in the subprime mortgage crisis, for example. I mean these were very uh, important. Uh, local, uh, you know, political um, acts as well, right? So when your house is being repossessed, but, you know, your community rallies to... Re so you reoccupy the house, so you're now squatting in the house that you yourself had formerly been paying the mortgage on, right? So you have these strange situations of, like, um, your position becoming illegal to an illegal one in the same uh, property. I think the debt project... I'm obviously, in a sense, like, <sighs> the systematic abolition of debt, I mean, even in that kind of like the last scene of Fight Club where they blow up all the credit card towers and everyone's debt is gone. You know, it's sort of like there's a kind of fantasy about, well, what would it mean to, like, to actually wipe out everyone's debt? Um, and, I, I mean, those micro of paying off or buying up debt, you know, are they, I wonder about their kind of systemic, do you know what I mean, force? Like... <laughs> yeah, I mean, they have symbolic force. Right. You know, but of course, at the same time, if it, if it stops someone's life from being worse, then that's fine. You know, I don't like these kind of apocalyptic arguments where it's like everything has to be really terrible and everyone has, you know, you know and then, like, that's, that's what politics will be, will be, you know, on the basis of this, like, nightmare. It's like, no, in the meantime, of course, you will do your best to, to sort of make sure people's lives aren't as bad as it gets, right? You know, so I mean, you, but you do have this sort of quite paradoxical situation, I suppose, where like, you know, all the austerity measures, you know, uh, I mean, I'm, like in Britain, we have this extraordinarily right-wing government who like uh, are destroying any micro remnant of the welfare state, like anything you can think of, right, from libraries to healthcare to you know, everything is like parcelled off or privatised or franchised um, or just simply uh, shut down. Um, so you have this situation where you have like, I guess sort of Marxists and anarchists who are like opposed to the, sta the state or like are for the withering where the state actually like defending the last remnants of the state, right, the welfare aspect. And I think what we're seeing then is the state just cutting off and like abnegating its relation to any form of public good or the public. And what you have then instead is simply public order 
So the state merely, you know, becomes this repressive thing once again. You know, there's like it's like the blip of the 20th century. You have this brief sort of few decades where, the, you know, for for not for you know uncynical economic reasons, but the state, you know, invests in its population. Then it's like no. We're not going to do that anymore. We're simply repressive now. It's just police, you know, that's what the state becomes. Yeah. I mean, like, sort of pushing at tendencies in order to make a polemical point, but nevertheless, I mean, that is what we see. <laughs> These are, I mean, you know, it's like, well, there are going to be like 10 new prisons, but there are, uh, you know, 10 new, 10 libraries being shut this week. You know, it's like, well, you know, they're both state. Uh, Functions, right? But but some of them are being destroyed, and the others are being kind of, you know, massively upped. What is the emotional exchange when you work for a state and sort of yeah. equal, and when yeah. most oftenly as a client you feel even guilty asking for something? So, and uh, yeah, like maybe uh, working in a public service in a former communist countries would. Mm, bring more negative emotions than, when, as you say, like positive or acting uh, on a positive yeah. note. Yeah, um, I th yeah, I think I think I know what you what you mean. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, I, when I started thinking about this a few years ago, I mean, it was also based on like personal experience of having to work like terrible agency jobs where no one would remember your name. You like you go and work somewhere for two weeks and. They'd just be like, oh, you, you know, whatever. Like, they wouldn't know who you were, and they'd just like, but you were supposed to be kind of like, how can I help? And, you know, like, be perky. And, and like, lots of these agencies were super feminized. They were, like, called office angels and things, you know, and it was like, it was, and it was branded as this kind of flexible thing for young women, ch young childless women to do, would be, like, to do information work, you know, data entry and, like, phone calls and, like, service builder. You know, and I just really hated it. I hated it so much. I wanted to like burn all the agencies down and this kind of thing. And like, actually, when they they started in Italy, people would firebomb the agencies, right? Because they knew what it meant. You know, because it's the destruction of like the worker as in relation to a specific place. You know what I mean? Because the flexibility. You know, y you don't know how many people are in the agency, right? You don't even know who the workforce is. You're 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 simply uh, this. I don't know, fragmentary, partial thing that's not even part of a, any collective, yeah? And you can be rang up at like 6.30 in the morning, like, will you go to this other part of town and like do data entry for eight hours, you know, this kind of thing. And so I was thinking a lot about that kind of, that move to the economy and what that does to like destroy forms of solidarity or collectivity or sense of belonging, right? And, you know, I, I look, I, you know, I don't know what it's like to work with a, a different, uh, goal or model in mind of solidarity or, you know, to work towards a, even if it's a fantasy of collective good. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, because the capitalist model is just, you know, the only freedom you have is the freedom to sell your labour power. I mean, you know, this is like, <laughs> do, you, do you know what I mean? Yeah, just because uh, I was listening and I thought it's so alien, all those Western ideas yeah. to today. Because we were brought like with uh, another idea, and um, we just start to learn how actually to perform, to be nice, to be good, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's the worst. I mean, like if there's any way of rolling back on that, you know. I mean, this is why I really, really like it when people in the service industry are really grumpy. Like they're my favorite people because it is a form of resistance. Honestly, I mean, it's like to refuse to like participate in this like, economy. Do you see what I mean? Like because. You know, the really difficult thing then is becomes this like question of how you strike. Like this is where the smile strike, which is kind of funny, funny idea, but also maybe, well, what you know, how do you withdraw your labor if what is if what you're selling is emotion? The you know, the emotions that are desirable from the standpoint of service economy, right, in the sense of like the, the ability to perform uh, you know, um, sort of smiley subservience or something. But you're right, I mean the other the flip side of this is like well, those things that are not valued, yeah, vulnerability, instability, I don't know, I mean, I mean everything that's, that's I guess, pathologised in a particular way in terms of, like, you know, depressive qualities or anxiety, you know, and these are all kind of, like, symptoms as well, I mean, very, very widespread symptoms of a relation to, to capital, and, you know, I mean, then you have, I mean, questions of, 
uh, I guess, you know, pharmacology and, you know, kind of mass control, you know, relation to, you know, and I, I don't, I, this is not like a moral question, I'm not posing it in terms of, you know, whether people should take um, SSRIs or anything like that, but I mean, you know, you see the, just the, the rise in this, this use of, uh, you know, particular kinds of medication. I mean, we, you know, in Britain, they use um, uh, cognitive behavioural therapy, like if you're long-term unemployed, they use particular, you know, um, techniques to try to uh, get you back into work. Yeah. And these are very superficial um, therapeutic techniques, you know, I mean, these are not like looking at the fundamental, you know, deep problems or issues. I mean, they're simply like, you need to be more goal-oriented, goal <laughs> you know, you need to have lists, you know, this kind of thing, like very... No, seri I mean, seriously, like very like sh shallow, you know, attempts to make people ready to work, you know, and, and this is, I don't know, I mean, I can't emphasise how much the, the, the figure of the worker, in the, uh, it's like a moral question, like it's like a personal moral failing if you can't get a job, you know, this is how it's like seen, it's even in areas where there's like mass unemployment and like, you know, there's like, I don't know, 70% unemployment or something, it's somehow still your fault you know, that you personally haven't got a job, you know. And the kind of rates of, like, depression among people who are long-term unemployed is extremely high. Um, and, yeah, so I'm guessing... Yeah, th I mean, this would be, like, the, the other side of the, this, I suppose. Like, what, what happens to the negative emotions that are generated by the same situation? Like, are they controlled by different um, elements of, like, of the economy, you know? when we're talking about the way in which the economy is kind of anthropomorphised and, you know, we're supposed to somehow care about it as if it had feelings um, and less about our feelings than, than its feelings, we might want to say, well, actually, you know, there is a, like, a lack of, a complete lack of, like, empathy, you know, actually. there, Of course there is. I mean, like, people making decisions that uh, destroy people's lives, that, you know, take benefits away from disabled... I mean, you know, like, this is, these are highly unempathetic... Uh, positions based on like a fantasy of a lack of vulnerability mm -hmm. you know it is it is a fantasy of like the human body as like you know not weak you know as kind of imp imp impervious as uh, never fragile you know that somehow you you yourself will never be in that position you will never be in this position of weakness right mm -hmm. and and I think there is a cognitive um, problem like I think you know people <laughs> in in positions of power like do find it very very hard to think about people who are not. I mean, they just don't understand, like, they just don't get it. Mm -hmm. You know, people who don't have money, people who are, like, unwell, people, you know, they can't think it through. You know, I mean, the question might be, how would we get them to feel empathy? Right, like, is it possible? You know, I don't know. I mean, maybe we would just have to re-educate them somehow, no? <laughs> I mean, like, well, I mean, what are you going to do? It's very difficult. I mean, you know, you live in a profoundly unempathetic model, right, system, you know, in which, like you say, all, most emotions are punished, and if they're not punished, they're exploited, right? So there's no room for that, you know, thinking about emotion as such, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know, I, you know, I don't know, what would, what would we do? I mean, does, does militant empathy need, need guns? I mean... <laughs> I think, like, just social media exposure uh, helps in that sense. That even politicians become. But are they shame? Do they feel shame? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. Yeah, the reaction not just like the, for their political features. And then also we just become mm -hmm. the dominant state that then oppresses like an class with a different ideology. So they just would, you know, would become this culture of shame that subjects groups of people to. Well, I mean, do it? this disavowal of dependency. You know that actually this model of like Homo eco economicus or the like the, the you know the isolated free voting individual is you know doesn't depend upon anyone else right which is a fantasy mm -hmm. which is hence all the mystification of all this labour that goes into that you know so you can pretend that you're this kind of self-sufficient individual yeah yeah but there is I think like recent ecological thinking also goes against that yeah so of there course there's so much theoretically that tries to discount that or change it yeah no no for sure. I don't know, I'm, I, it's a nice opportunity to maybe also, um, the, the sort of idea of empathy, um, I mean, I'm, yeah, you're, you're coming from, from a, a, a perspective, like a, 
Western European perspective in, in and in English specifically. Yep, sadly. I'm, I'm, I'm really interested to hear kind of what, for instance, like this, these ideas of, of let's say, of empathy as a strategy, how, how they resonate here. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if you have maybe some more questions for everyone else, but the, um, uh, and more, maybe more specifically, like, yeah, is, is it, do you, or do you feel lack of empathy, or is it, um, is it the opposite? Is there perhaps, um, yeah, are you about yeah. The sorry, are you Um, I'm asking very hypothetical now. <laughs> <laughs> what if we consider the arts as an engine for prophetic education or as, as, a, uh, as a bridge, as a prophetic bridge mm -hmm. to the world who are in the New Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, there's lots of interesting things you could say about sentimental education or aesthetic education. I mean, you know, one thing that has been. <sighs> you know, pretty much destroyed its free access to that in <laughs> Britain. I mean, in terms of education, you know, I mean, if you, if you want to go and study art, you have to borrow £9,000 a year, right, just to pay your fees, you know, let alone living, you know. So, I mean, there's a kind of, obviously, like, enclosure or privatisation of access to aesthetic experience, right? I mean, and, you know, the, the kind of role of the art market as well in terms of, you know, I mean, as, as we know. <laughs> um, but yes, in principle, I mean, you know, I'm not against this idea of like a kind of humanist or sentimental education. I think, you know, there are some things you, you can only learn through aesthetic experience, perhaps. You know, and, and pe lots of people have made the argument that without um, culture in this, well, or that at least culture allows you to feel, in a way, to feel for the other in some ways. Yeah complex ways. <laughs> we can we can stop. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Alright. That's okay.